a conversation with the Creative Ensemble with a very special moderator, another man who dreams on canvases large and small, ladies and gentlemen, J.J. Abrams. Hi, everyone. Hey, friends, thank you so much for, uh, for coming out. Uh, it's uh, an honor to be here tonight to talk about such an exceptional film. Uh, I'd like to introduce some uh, people to you. First, the co-writer, Mr. Patrick McHale. Uh, the composer of the score tonight, uh, Mr. Alexandre Desplat. Uh, the director of character fabrication, uh, Georgina Haynes. The voice of Candlewick, Mr. Finn Wolfhard. The voice of Count Vope, Mr. Christoph Waltz. The voice of what, what's going on? The voice of Pinocchio and Carlo, Mr. Gregory Mann. The co-director, Mark Gustafson. And the co-director, co-writer, producer, mi amigo, the one and only, Mr. Guillermo del Toro. Thank you uh, all for being here tonight. So uh, just would love to start, if you don't mind, with the writing of this. Um, I know it's a movie that has taken you quite a while to get made. Uh, if you could talk for a moment about what Pinocchio has meant to you, and if you could talk about the writing, how much you wanted to stay loyal to the original stories, and how much you wanted to go elsewhere. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the presence of someone without whom this movie wouldn't exist, because what sparked everything, every possibility. In 2002, Gris Grimley published his Pinocchio. He's here in the audience. And uh, the moment I saw that design, I understood everything. I well, we can go this way. So, you know, it, it took uh, about, about 16 years to make the movie. Uh, and a good chunk of the solving of the problems. It was very clear to me from the beginning that it was going to be about losing a child and gaining another, and that it was going to be connected through the tree, and the cricket would live in there, and that we'd do it in the time of war. And then through the years, it evolved, and I would like to have Patrick talk a little bit about it. I, I think Patrick was vital for me as, uh, you know, having dialogue with collaborators is extremely good. And um, we refined and argued and argued some more. And he was patient enough to chase me through the world. He would travel whenever I was shooting something. Or uh, So, Patrick, why don't you uh, empty all the hatred and love? Go right ahead. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it was kind of figuring out the characters and who they were. It was it was so uh, so much about the the father and son relationship um, and how that you know uh, evolves over the course of the story and these different kind of father and son relationships uh, and that's kind of prism um, that we're looking at these different um, angles of of those kinds of relationships. Um, but really, it was so important to figure out who Pinocchio was and how he um, exists in this this very specific world. Um, so that was kind of the main focus, I think, for me. It was important for us to do things that came from the novel, but uh, nobody else had done. Burning the legs, crushing the cricket over and over and over and over again. Uh, the, 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 other day, the idea of him dying and being taken by the black rabbits of death, uh, which comes from the novel. But then, uh, basically, we turned the whole story upside down. It was not about obedience being a virtue, but disobedience being a virtue. And instead of everybody changing Pinocchio, he changes everybody. 
the cricket starts as this pompous guy that thinks himself a philosopher and ends up being a simple guy that loves life. The father starts talking about perfection and he ends up accepting him exactly as he is, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, all the stories of fathers and sons are also the political side with the horrible version of paternalism that is fascism. And uh, even Jesus is a story about a father and a son. And uh, there are echoes all through the movie, like Pinocchio loses the same arm than the Jesus. Uh, uh, you know, when we started constructing this throughout, uh, throughout the whole process, the beauty of animation is that it's really slow. So you have time to think, meditate, chew on. We shot for a thousand days, which is more my speed, frankly. <laughs> I want to do that all the time. I know we have eight people and 20 minutes, so yeah. you do the math, but uh, I just wanted to ask if you talk just for a second about uh, your relationship with the story and your mother. Yeah, uh, briefly, uh, this is one of the primordial stories of my life, this and Frankenstein. They are the most autobiographical things I can think of because when I saw it with my mom, it was the second or third movie we saw. The first one was <laughs> William Wyler's Wuthering Heights for some reason. And uh, the second one was this. And I, the only thing I remember is thinking, this is the only movie I've seen that shows how scary it is to be a kid. You know, and and it, it stayed with me and I felt that I'm Pinocchio. Uh, and, and I think that uh, that's what kept it alive all these years. And, and uh, we, uh, we really needed the entire team the, of people. We had hundreds of people working, uh, and, and everybody was a partner at a very deep level. My partnership with Mark is a blessing and, uh, and uh, profound, and I'm extremely happy to have found such a collaboration with him. Uh, Gregory, what was it like when you found out you, uh, you got the role? Uh, for any 10-year-old boy to find out that they got the part of Pinocchio, I was over the moon, uh, running around, jumping, screaming of joy. Uh, to find out I was working with Guillermo and Mark, it was just incredible. Uh, I didn't know who they were too much as I was very young, but... <laughs> I knew that Guillermo made the book of life and that Mark was part of Fantastic Mr. Fox. <laughs> but as I've got older, I think I can appreciate that work a lot more. And now that I get to say I've been in a movie with them and I've worked with them, I'm going to remember it for the rest of my life. That answer was extraordinary, honestly. Um, <laughs> it was. Uh, Mr. Waltz, uh, could you just talk about Volpe for a, a moment? I'm just curious what your experience is. Obviously, it's always a different thing doing an animated film from a live action. But does, did the final product, did it match what you saw in your head when you were performing the, the voice? Say that again. Hold on one second. Did it match what you, in your mind, what you saw when you were doing it? Did it match? Of course not. Not at all. <laughs> it wasn't anywhere close. Um, it's it's an interesting process because it starts with um, you kind of uh, uh, a flight by night, uh, you know, and um, it slowly comes together as the gentlemen decide what to do with uh, what you did. And um, it takes some getting used to, but, you know, with a little help from the friends. Um, Mr. Desplat, uh, the score is so... Beautiful. It's so lovely. Um, I'm ju just curious, were you, did you score to animatics? Were you scoring to the script? Did you wait until there were shots for you to see? I'm just curious the process for you. Well, the songs were, were to be written before. So we, we wrote the songs like three years ago, maybe. Um, then we recorded these wonderful actors, singers. Um, and yes, we waited and then for, for, the, for the, the film to be edited. There were still some little animatic uh, sections, but most of it was, was there. And uh, 
And by having the songs ahead of time, we also decided with Guillermo that we could take some of the motifs of the songs and interweave. Because sometimes in movies you have the song and then the song is gone and the score takes over. Takes over. We wanted the score and the songs to be really, really interweaving all through the film to keep us, you know, so that it, it really was organic to the, to the story. And just curious, I'm, I'm curious your feeling when you are scoring something and your scores are always so stirring and emotional. For, for this especially, where you use, what is your approach? Do you use your heart more? Do you use your mind more? Like, are you, how much are you just feeling as you, because you're so expressive, it's remarkable. French has, the French have no heart, you know. No, what we did, what we did with Guillermo, we, we used an orchestra made of wood. No, no, I'm not kidding. It's just, it's only wood instruments. So, so the sound is a bit, it seems normal, but actually it's abnormal. It's, it's strange and, and a, bit, a bit off because of that. It's just woodwinds, piano, guitars, harps, you know, uh, um, no metal. Uh, so I guess it also gives a, an intimacy and a connection with, with Pinocchio. And aside from that, it's just working with Guillermo and trying to find the right uh, emotions. I, I tend to, to, to pre prefer being restrained when I write music, but Guillermo pushes me in a good direction to be more expressive, you know, more, uh, more Mexican. It's a beautiful score. <laughs> um. Uh, Georgina, the, the, the work that you did in this film was just mind-blowing, mind-blowing. Um, I'm just curious what the experience was working with Guillermo. You've worked on so many amazing films, you know, Coraline, one of them. I'm just curious, what was the experience working with Guillermo on, on this? Well, firstly, it wasn't just me that made the puppets. It was three amazing teams of puppet makers across the world. We had a team in England, McKinnon and Saunders, there was the team at Shadow Machine in Portland, um, and there was a small team in Guadalajara as well. And yeah, uh, amazing puppet makers. Um, but what was, I think for all of us, what was so amazing working with Guillermo and Mark was the passion, the passion for the story, the passion for the characters. So it was already set up for us. You know, we, we just made these beautiful puppets that were designed, um, you know, by, by Guy Davis, um, under Guillermo and Mark's sort of guidance. Um, and then sort of the love that came together to create those puppets and, and the talent. We had the best puppet makers in the world working on this show. Um, and I think you can see it. <laughs> it's incredible work. Um, Finn, so you're on a show called Stranger <laughs> Things. So um, just curious. Uh, your work on this was so great, and the character has this great arc. Uh, you did such an amazing job. Uh, I'm just curious how you, first of all, did you record your stuff with other actors, or were you often alone, so you did? Well, yeah, I was lucky enough to go to London and record with Gregory, like, I don't know, it was a long time ago, it was like three or four years ago, um, and it was amazing. We just sat in this little booth in Soho, and Guillermo was on, I think he was on Zoom, and we did that scene in the in the bedroom where we're you know talking and uh, it was it was great because we we started doing the scene and I remember Guillermo just going like all right now this one try quieter and so then we tried it quieter and he was like even quieter than that like even quieter and it got to the point where we were just like really whispering like very 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 quietly and it got to the point where it was like. You know, because when you're, I guess, in a room with a mic, you just think you have to talk really loud, like, because it's just this thing in front of you. Um, but we kind of forgot about the mics and just sat there, like, just across from each other. Um, and I think it really helped. Um, and, yeah, it was just a really, really great experience. It's a, the, the, the arc that your character goes through is so subtle, and it's so... It's so beautiful in that, that scene where they befriend each other, where he finally sort of really turns and asks if he's scared and if he's afraid. Uh, I just wanted to say, I think you just did a lovely job. It was really oh, beautiful. Thank you. Um, and so uh, I didn't mean to leave you out, Mark, um, but I wanted to get back to you, you both on directing. Um, one of the amazing things about th this 
particular animated film it is the subtleties of motion and movement and behavior. You know, little details of things that happen, you know, the second closing of the door when Carlo comes, Carlos comes in to the house, just little things that just feel like accidents. But of course, nothing is an accident when you're doing this. And your work has, prior to this is obviously legendary and extraordinary, but this in particular just felt so special. How did you approach the animation in that particular subtle way? Well, I think one of the principles that we started with was trying to give more agency back to the animators themselves. So we selected our animation team very, very carefully. And when you work with people over the course of a thousand days, you really get to know them and understand them and understand their strengths. So we tried to, uh, we tried to cast certain animators with certain characters and keep them on scene so they would have ownership of those scenes. Uh, and then people were much more invested that way. And then we also had this, this notion that it was something that was very important to Guillermo, uh, this idea of failed acts. Uh, it's something that gives uh, uh, a sort, of, sort of verisimilitude uh, to the movement. You know, it's like, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to happen, this extra little thing, yeah. but if you do it, all of a sudden, you buy into the scene as being something very, very real. There's my favorite moment probably in terms of those things is we said and we should animate unnecessary things because that's life. And my favorite favorite, which is I think prodigious is when he bumps on the balloon and then bumps onto the other balloon and he gets tangled and he gets angry. And of course, it's, it looks improvised if we were live action, but you had to have the balloon on a rig, on a this, on a that and it looks like life. And I think that's what uh, made it special. And, and the thing is, uh, we, uh, we wanted truth out of animation. We didn't want to present you the world as an idealized thing, homogenized and pasteurized for the consumption of a really helicoptering parent. Because it's not about the kids. The kids love the world. It's the parents that want to fucking homogenize it and pasteurize it for like a school meal, you know? And, and we were together and I must say, what is very moving is a thousand days of shoot and the animators were turning the best work still. Last week of shoot, last day of shoot, last day of shoot, last animator animating, my man here. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, he, <laughs> I, I, the, the truth is I had not animated a shot in probably 20 years, and we were out of animators, we were ramping down, and there was one thing that had to be done, and so I, I ripped off my what, what, we, what was that shot? What was it? it oh, I'm not gonna say. <laughs> I will, I will, I will, I'll say it. Is the, is the, the, no. the priest and the, the kids uh, the, uh, looking at the, at the Jesus? And it was out of sync by a few frames. And I said, Mark, we got to reshoot it. And Mark says, there's nobody left. <laughs> and he said, I'll do it. But, you know, I think, uh, I think this, you know, the other principle that guided, and I want to say it here, because we're so horrifyingly domesticated with animation being too active, is to be quiet. And Miyazaki says two things that I think are essential and became our Bible. He said, if we animate the ordinary, it will be extraordinary. And he said, and that was like engraved. And the second thing he says is, Western animation is interested in the clapping. I'm interested in the space between the claps. And I think it's so beautiful. Uh, there's a small homage to one of the most amazing movies in the history of the medium called The Red Turtle. And the crabs at the end, which everybody hated me for putting the crabs in the sand, but it's an homage to The Red Turtle. And they did it, and it's a masterpiece, and it's full of this life. I believe in animation as a medium that can push into a beautiful, adult, complete form of art as it should be. And I, I just want to say one more time, the animators deserve a huge amount of credit yes. for the work that they did on this. They brought so much to it. Uh, 
Uh, just a couple more, more questions. Just, Patrick, was, was there anything that in the script that, uh, as written, that you uh, felt was particularly special to you that, that you got to see brought to life in this film? Yeah, I, there's, there's a lot. Um, I, think, I think the thing, the, the one that, when we finally figured out um, the line from the, the, the Sphinx kind of um, character, when she says uh, about, I forget the line now, but it's something like, um, y you don't know how long you have with someone until they're gone. And that kind of sewed up the whole kind of theme, thematic everything of the movie to me. And it was like, oh, there, that's, that's it. That's, and so like to see that on the screen and to, to kind of feel it all kind of connect there, I think is, is the moment. May I say, by the way, that Patrick is Pinocchio. <laughs> he has a, an innocence and a purity and a life that both Mark and I agree uh, he, he is Pinocchio. And, and, and I think he, that was the virtue. We argued beautifully, by the way. We argued, we argued beautifully. And, and we'll argue at dinner, because it's the first time he's seen it. Yeah. <laughs> but it, 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 well, that was so, it was yeah. so great to that we could, you know, and it was, it was fun. Wait, this is the first time you've seen it? The, no, I, 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 I no, come here on the finished. screen. Yeah, yeah. finished. What the hell? <laughs> Very confusing. Um, I, I cannot tell you uh, what a joy it is to talk about something that is so truly brilliant and such a labor of love, and uh, you are all so wonderful in your capacities on this film, and it's an honor to get to sit with you and talk to you. Congratulations on Pinocchio. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye, Acton.